Hey, good morning, everybody. It is good to see you all this morning. Welcome. Um, it's beautiful Lord's Day. Um, for those, um, there's, there's nobody I, I see as a visitor here. There might be some online. I want to tell you a little bit about the church and, 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 and what we believe. We believe in one true and living God who created us in his image. And he offers us two things through his son, Jesus Christ. Only two things. Peace of mind in this life. That doesn't mean there's not going to be problems and trials and heartaches and things like that. But at the end of the day, we have peace of mind. And the last thing, the best thing, hope in the resurrection. That's why we're here today. We're here today to worship him and to glorify him. So we're, we're glad that you're with us this morning. And let's start with pr prayer, please. Father, we come to you this day thanking you for the beauty of your creation. It speaks to a designer and a creator that is you, and we honor and we glorify you for that. Father, we pray that as we enter this time together that uh, your spirit will move among us, that we will encourage each other, that we will praise you in song and in prayer, and as we partake of, of your uh, Holy Communion, Father, we pray for a blessing for that. Father, please be with us, for it's in your Son's name that we pray. Amen. Lord, the people who praise you, Lord, the people who praise you, lift you up and praise you, lift you up and praise you, cause you are the Holy One, you are the Holy One, you're the one, you're the only one, you're the one, you're the only one. Lord, the people love you, Lord, the people love you, place nobody above you, place nobody above you. We will bless you as you come back. We will bless you as you come back. 
morning. Uh, for communion, I'm going to re be reading out of John 11. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even God will give you whatever you ask. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. After the death of their brother, Martha and Mary both had the same reaction when they saw Jesus. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Martha and Mary both knew that Jesus had the power to prevent Lazarus' death. But they both seemed to be questioning why Jesus was not there to prevent the death. Like, Mary, like Martha and Mary, many people tend to have questions for our Lord. Why did this happen, Lord? Do you care? Where are you? It is natural to wonder why some things happen in our lives. It can be especially puzzling if we believe in God and, in, and his power. But Jesus gives us the answer for why bad things happen. Our reactions to the challenges we face in our lives gives us the chance to show the glory of God. If we react to challenges with patience and the belief that God will help us through whatever we face, we are living out our faith and glorifying God. Others may notice how we handle the situation and wonder how we are remaining so calm or keeping a positive attitude. This is our faith at work in us and the chance for God to be glorified. Jesus had his own question for God. As he hung on the cross, Jesus asked, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was wondering where his father was. That day, God was with his son as he hung on the cross. He gave Jesus the strength to endure that horrific day. God never forsakes us or abandons us. God is always with us, helping us through our challenges by providing us with the strength we need to face the situation. Jesus endured the horrific mental and physical pain of his death in order for God to be glorified. May our reactions to the challenges we face allow others to see God at work in our lives and give him the glory he deserves. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you never abandon us and that you're always with us no matter what the situation is. You never promised us that we would not face hardships, but you always promised us that you would be with us. We pray, Lord, that our faith in you may strengthen us in whatever challenges we face. We also pray, Lord, that we, were, that we remember to give you praise for helping us through the tough situations and also during the times when we are experiencing good things happening. We thank you, Lord, for helping Jesus through that day when he hung on the cross for our sins. And we thank you, Lord, for his resurrection, which gives us the opportunity for eternal life with you. And we ask, Lord, your blessing upon this bread, which represents Christ's body hung on the cross for our sins. We thank you, Lord, for our love, or for your love, and we pray that we may pass that on to all that we meet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Dear Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon the fruit of the vine, which represents Christ's blood poured out for our sins. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be with you forever. And we pray that our lives may glorify you and that people will come to know you through our actions and words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, good morning again, everybody. Have you ever, um, as you've been reading your Bibles, come across some things in the Bible that makes you kind of stop and go, really? Is that the way it really happened? I'll give you four examples here, and they're up on the screen. In 2 Samuel chapter 13, there's a man by the name of Uzzah. Uzzah is a priest of the tribe of Levi. There's 30,000 men around this event that's happening, and the priests are moving the Ark of the Covenant. His brother is at the front of the oxen. The Bible says it's a new cart, and us, us is at the rear of the cart. The cart literally hits a pothole, and the Ark begins to tip. And just like all of us, what would you do? Instinctively reach out your hand to steady that Ark, and for that, God struck Uzzah dead immediately. Another example, 1 Samuel chapter 6, a guy by name of Saul. We know him as King Saul. 
The Philistine army is arrayed against the children of Israel. They're itching for a fight. Saul knows that the prophet Samuel must come and, and bless the battle that's about to, be, that's about to happen and ask God's, for God's protection. Samuel delays in coming. Saul gets nervous. So Saul goes ahead and he offers an offering and he prays. And as soon as he's done, Samuel shows up and says, what have you done? And for that, for his impatience, God takes the kingdom away from Saul and his family. Another one. In Numbers chapter 20, the guy who did not want to be a leader, Moses, he's leading the children of Israel. And, and, as, you, and as you know that story, the, the relationship between the children of Israel and God and, and the children of Israel and Moses was up and down at best. And in Numbers chapter 20, they're, they're hungry, they're thirsty, they're in the desert. They're complaining. And Moses has had it up to here and then to here. And so instead of speaking to a rock, he takes his staff and he strikes the rock twice. Water comes forth. But for that, God takes away from Moses his interest, entrance into the promised land. And the last one, even in the New Testament, the church is in its infancy. It's getting off the ground. People are excited about being Christians. And they're buying and selling whatever they can. They're bringing it and laying it at the apostles' feet so that the word of God could go throughout the world. And there's a man and his wife. And they sell a piece of land. And they come in and... One at a time, they lay the money down at the apostles' feet. And the apostle Peter says, is that all of the money that you got from the proceeds of that sale? And one at a time, they said, yes, that's all. And for that lie, God struck them both dead that day. And when you read those accounts, if you're like me, and, and the way we talk today, you go, Really? Haven't we all done similar things, and, and quite honestly, uh, speaking for me, far worse things than any of those things? Hit the next one for us, Justin. And the problem is, it's our worldview, right? We live in, in, a, in a time and an age where it's very centric. It's all about me, and it's the love of me. We see ourselves as the highest authority, and we're very quick to say, that's not fair. But the problem is we give little thought and little rights to what God deserves and the rights that God has because he is God. And I think these accounts in Scripture are there to show us that there's something that exists of far greater value than your opinion and mine. They're sacred things. They're things that belong to God. And the thing I want to talk to you about today, and I, and I hope to bring a little bit different perspective to it, and I hope that maybe if, if you have your Bibles handy on your mobile device or whatever, that you jot these scriptures down and, and take a look at really what God is communicating to us through his word about his sacred church. And there's no greater honor than, than being a part of that church. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much uh, for this day, for this time that we have together. We pray, Father, that you will speak to us through your word. Father, please remove my sins and my shortcomings from everyone's remembrance and that they only hear you speaking through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Got a question for you. When was the last time that you were all struck of being a part of God's body, the church. Did you come here this morning thinking, man, I can't believe I am a part of this thing called the church? Or did you, like I have done a thousand times, look at your watch, oh man, I gotta get in the car and get to the church building. Or, oh, it's 1029, I better log on real quick. 
Listen to what Paul has to say and really keep these scriptures in mind as, as we go through them this morning. For no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes, nourishes it and cherishes it. We relate to that, right? We take care of our own physical bodies. Just as the Lord does his church, for we are his body, his flesh, and of his bones. And if you don't take a few minutes to really contemplate that verse and really be stunned by what it's saying, I think we really miss the boat. That we are somehow a part of his body. Paul refers to it as a great mystery that you and I as human beings are joined to a God who is of unapproachable light. Paul says the mystery is profound. I'm saying that that mystery is about Christ and the church. We all know from science class in, I don't know, 6th grade, 7th grade, 93 million miles from the sun, right? We certainly can't go touch the sun. You can't even go outside and stare at the sun. But somehow, we are connected to a being that is of unapproachable light to the point that his high angels cover themselves in his presence. And yet somehow we're a part of that holy body. And why would someone so extraordinary choose to care for you and I like he does his own body? There's a scene in the Old Testament that's an incredible one. Solomon has just finished building the temple. Remember that was... David wanted to do it, his father, that was taken away from him because of some indiscretions in his life. His son Solomon builds the temple. This scene is the dedication of the temple, the grand opening of the temple. When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifice. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Now just think about that for a second. You're standing there. Solomon's praying, everyone's praying along with him, and as soon as he's done praying, fire comes down from heaven, consumes the offerings and the sacrifice, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground And they worshiped, and they gave thanks to the Lord, saying, He is good, his love endures forever. Wouldn't you like to have been there? Wouldn't you like to have seen that and to experience that? I know what, I I would have passed out. I just would have fell over. But to, to see that and to witness that, and can you imagine worshiping collectively with that group of people all at the same time and seeing heaven and earth intersect and his glory fills that temple? Well, I got news for you. You and I are something even better than that. As much as I would like to have seen that, we see something even better in the New Testament. Check out these words. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners or strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling which God lives by his spirit. We are now a part of a building that God lives in. Can you even begin to wrap your mind around that? That is just an incredible, awesome thought that each of us are a part of this building. And somehow, by the blood of Jesus, we become worthy with others to form a dwelling place for God. Peter refers to us as living stones. We are in the same structure as the apostles and prophets, with Jesus being the chief cornerstone. I appreciate, I didn't pick out the song Cornerstone this morning, Andrew did. I really appreciate that song because it's exactly what we're talking about. 
And somehow through some process that transcends space and time, we're a part of this temple that God inhabits. And it is a temple because God lives in it. Now, I took a real feeble attempt at, at an image up here because I wanted, I wanted to plant, if you're like me, you remember pictures, you don't remember words. Okay? So what Paul's refer, what he's illustrating in Ephesians is that we're a part of a temple. It's built on the prophets and the apostles. And you can see there at the lowest level, I listed Joel, Amos, Samuel, Isaiah. Of course, there's many others. Right above them, I listed four apostles. Jesus being the chief cornerstone. But here's the thing that blows my mind. Is that each one of us, and I had to merge some of us together because my picture didn't have that many stones in it. Okay? And I hope, I hope I got everybody. But anyhow, we each are a living stone in a temple that God inhabits. If that doesn't give you pause to just stop and stare at it, don't try to understand it. Don't try to figure out how he did it. That's what Scripture tells us that he did. That is utterly amazing. That is something to marvel at. That's something to worship. With that, though, comes a warning. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple, and God's Spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. We are a part of his sacred body. We shouldn't be doing anything that injures injures the body. Think back a few minutes ago when we were talking about the dedication of the temple. Okay? And the fire's coming down from heaven, right? What would have happened if someone would have taken a sledgehammer and started hitting the wall of that temple? They would have ceased to exist. And for that one, you'd say, "Uh, that guy got what he deserved, right? You can understand that one. But Paul says, if anyone destroys the temple, God will destroy that person. And you say, well, why is God so harsh? And it's because the temple's sacred. It's holy. We're sacred. We're holy. We're the church. We're the temple that God lives in. And this next part really made me stop and pause. Every time we speak evil or ill of a, of a fellow church member, it's like taking a sledgehammer to that temple. Titus says, if anyone is causing divisions among you, give, first, uh, give a first and second warning, and after that have nothing to do with them. And why is that? Because we can't be tearing down the temple. We can't be tearing down the place where God lives. That's each one of us. You may have heard that we got an election coming up, right? Or if you get on social media, you know, uh, people have some opinions, don't they? Um, We evaluate everything. We're free to offer our opinions. Everything is up for our critique and our evaluation. And And so it is in the church. The church is not immune to that. And so instead of marveling at this incredible mystery that we're all a part of, we critique the leadership. We critique the speaker. You're probably critiquing my slides right now. Because uh, I have. <laughs> uh, we critique the music, the length of the sermon. We critique everything. We shouldn't be doing that. We, that's the same as taking the sledgehammer to the temple. There's an incredible scene. I hope you take a few moments uh, today or tomorrow, whenever. Read Revelation chapter 4 and 5. You're a part of something so much greater than yourself. And something that's so sacred, it's unbelievable. And it's all because of Jesus' sacrifice. In in Revelations chapter 4 and 5, this is obviously an artistic attempt at rendering what's going on there. There's this incredible scene that John is given the privilege to see. God seated on his throne. Around the throne are four living beings. Around them there are 24 elders. 
And as you, as you read down through there, when you get into chapter 5, we become a part of the scene. Verse 8 says, And when he took the scroll, the four living beings and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they held gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. So in this scene, all the prayers that everybody of faith, all Christians have offered throughout the ages, are there in that scene. Isn't that an incredible thought? We show up again in verse 13. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, they sang blessing and honor and glory and power and belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. There we are again. We're, we're in a throne of billions singing praise to God. Isn't that magnificent? You know, I think that in, in today's world, though, such a tremendous, unspeakable honor may, may feel insufficient for those who are used to being the god of their own social media accounts, right? Uh, they're all clamoring for attention. The problem with that is that we don't know that we don't realize that true joy comes from just the opposite. Joy comes as we stand among those whom Jesus has redeemed and getting lost in a sea of worship truly becoming a part of something that was sacred. Gathering as the church, whether we're online or here in the building, that should lead us to holy ground. That should lead us to something sacred. You get to worship someone else other than yourself, and you get to do it with other people too. We get to pour out our love to Him and serving others by considering them more important than ourselves. You know, it's not about you and I. It's about something far greater than that. It's truly sacred to be a member of the church. Have you ever stopped and thought about that you were a part of an eternal plan? <clears throat> Excuse me, before you ever existed? Paul in Ephesians 1 writes, Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. He chose us before the foundations of the world, before he even created the world. He included us in his plans for, for the church. This verse I really want you to read and study study this week, Ephesians chapter 3, and really listen to this. Although I am the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ, and made plain to everyone the administration of, his, of this mystery, for which in ages past were kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms. If that doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what will. Let's break it down a little bit. The manifold wisdom. What, what does that mean? If you're a car enthusiast, enthusiast you know that a manifold simply distributes. It, 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 it varies. You can read about the manifold theory in mathematics. Um, it, it separates, it distributes. So God has this knowledge that was hidden, that he created all things, and that now through the church, through us, through you and I, his, the vastness of his wisdom should be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. God wanted to show the heavenly beings his incomparable wisdom, so he created the church. And we are to behave and function in such a way that the rulers in the heavenly places marvel at his creation. Paul explains that the great mystery God is now revealing is the Gentiles becoming members of the church. And no longer is salvation just for the Jewish people, it's for the Gentiles. We're thankful for that because that includes you and I. 
can be a part of the same body of what, because of what Jesus did on the cross. This is the divine mystery that was hidden for ages. And can you just, just imagine in your mind these beings and rulers in the heavenly places that, that we can't see, that they are marveling and they're gasping at, at what they see. They see the church. They see God's wisdom playing out through your lives. People of every race are becoming one body. That's truly amazing. God joining himself to his creation <clears throat> and allowing them to be a part of his body. That's unbelievable. And that's been the plan all along for God to dwell with his people of all races in complete unity, forming the temple, the dwelling place of God. What would our society look like if the majority of people understood and believed that right now? Wouldn't that change everything? The greatest hope that this world has, the greatest hope that our society has right now is not in some presidential candidate. It's not in a political party. It's not in Facebook or Twitter or, or any of that other garbage. It's in the church because of what Jesus did for us. And sadly, some, many, see the church as optional. It's obsolete. It's outdated. It's something that old people go do. And not even many of them do that anymore. We'd rather connect to God on our own terms. But when you look at the church from God's perspective, you're truly left to wonder what you are part of. Heavenly being shocked at God's church while many on earth just yawn. You know, we don't need, we don't need fancy music or great speakers or any of that other stuff to be what God intended us to be. The hope for this community is in the church. And I'll tell you something Brad said a couple weeks ago really hit me pretty hard was he made a comment that, you know, many of us were anxious to come back here and go to church. I personally, I really don't like that term. I, I try to say, let's go to worship. Okay. But many of us were anxious to get back to the building. Not one of us asked the question, what can we do to introduce others to Jesus Christ? Because we have the message that the world needs. In closing today, I, I don't know if there's anyone online, I think everyone here has, has accepted Jesus and been baptized for, his sins, for, for our sins. If you haven't, if you haven't done that as an adult believer, you need to do that. I would love to sit down and open up a Bible and just read together about what God wants us to do to become a part of his church. And it's really simple. It's to believe. It's to confess that his son is who he said he was, to repent of our sins, and to be baptized for the forgiveness of those sins would love to do that with anybody I'm Dave, Rich, Dave there's many here that would, that would love the same opportunity if you haven't marveled at what you're a part of and if you haven't understood or maybe forgotten why you're a part of, of a church I pray that this week you take a look at that I pray you spend some time praying about that rereading some of these verses that you're truly a part of something sacred and something eternal. Thank you, Roger, for that wonderful lesson. And like Roger said this week, I pray maybe you do look back over the, the sermon and pick out those ver verses because while they were being put up there, I was writing them down. So I will take some time to study them. Uh, this morning, we had the opportunity to go to Heavenly Father in prayer for those that might be in need. And on our prayer list, we have Harold and Adele Dorsey with health concerns, uh, the Strouser family with strength and healing, Leslie Daymater's niece with cancer, our students, teachers, and other school workers as they resume school, and hopefully everything goes well there. And Eleanor asked me to put Lynn... Uh, on, on the prayer list, her daughter, she's having some health problems there. 
So as we begin this week, uh, continue to pray for all those people, each and every one of us. Uh, pray for even the ones that are healthy, because we all need the prayers to help us get through certain situations that go on. And one other thing I just want to let everybody know, in two weeks, we will be at Lions Lake at our outdoor service, and there's plenty of room to social distance there. Uh, we've got plenty of room to out there. Uh, there will be a meal provided after the service, so uh, look forward to, to two weeks being outside in, uh, in the wonderful free air, and uh, we can enjoy the, the beauty of what God has created. So let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. In prayer. Most great Heavenly Father, we are truly grateful for this opportunity allows to gather here this morning to hear a portion of your word proclaimed and special blessing upon the speaker for taking time to present that lesson here. And I pray that we all had open minds and open hearts and that we truly understood what was said here and we can use in our daily walk of life with you. Heavenly Father, we're mindful of all those that were mentioned on our prayer list. <clears throat> we pray that you administer them as you can. Heavenly Father, we know that you know all things at all times. And if it is your will, you will heal them. You will help them get through the situations that are going on in their life and, and help them to put the anguish away that could be on their heart. We pray, Heavenly Father, for the leaders of our country as things are going on here, Heavenly Father, in our country, that they might look to you for guidance. And as Roger said, it, if if we did what some of the things that he said, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be a much better place that we could all get along and we wouldn't have to worry about the things that are going on we are truly mindful that we have a chance of eternity when the time is right when heavenly when jesus will return and we look forward to that time that new place he has so richly prepared where, where there'll be no more sickness no more tears no more anguish it'll be all joy and we look forward to that heavenly father we ask you to watch over our military people as they're away from their homes the first responders as they're doing what needs to be done, uh, the police departments as they help to keep calm throughout the, the country. Heavenly Father, watch over them, keep them safe in all that they do. And Heavenly Father, as we begin this new week, watch over us, keep us strong, keep your protected hand upon us. And we pray that you be with Brad and Gail as they're returning home from their vacation. Give them a safe journey home and your protected hand upon them. We ask now you forgive us of our sins. We ask these in your most holy, blessed name. Amen. Go teach, live, and love like Jesus. Y'all have a great week.